All right, now this is something we've seen online is slightly sensationalized. Uh, but it says that you've admitted that you were tempted to engage in homosexual activity in prison. Now, I heard your explanation, but I'd like the, our, our viewers to hear what you have to say about that. Well, I, you know, it, a lot of that was going on in Rayford, not so much in New York State Prison, which I served in both, but in Rayford there was this homo there named Brahma's Mama. And all the men were after, actually he got married to one of the, on, a, on the yard one Saturday, he got married, a big ceremony. I wasn't interested in Bahamas mama, but it was going on and I thought, well, you know, maybe, uh, I, would, I just thought that to myself and I, I had to confess that I did think that, but trust me, I never engaged, right, I, now, I never went in front of Now, do you agree that prison is a place where they try to break your mind down and bring you to, to the lowest level of yourself, to your most savage self, to where you would even consider that? I mean, is that something you would have considered out just in the regular world? Not on the street, no, no way. Right. Prisons are inhumane places. I, you're better off dead than going to a prison. I don't care if it's a short period of time or a long period of time. And people who do life in prison, uh, it isn't life, it's, it's the worst possible thing that can happen to anybody to go to prison. They're just inhumane. Either you make people pay for what they do or find some other way of dealing with it. But when you send a man to prison, he loses everything. I don't care what he does when he comes out. He, he just loses his life. Okay, so you're in prison. What happens? Is this the, is this the time when you found God, per se? At the Brooklyn House of Detention, yeah, I did. <laughs> Brooklyn House of Detention. <laughs> I used to live up the street from there, all right. <laughs> um, so you know where it's at on Atlantic Avenue? Yeah, right off State Street. I lived yeah. on State Street. Yeah. Well, you know, having been raised the way I was raised, I was college trained, I was um, married, had two children, had a great job making more money than anybody in my family, anybody from that little town had ever made, including many of the white folk that were there. And in July, uh, during the year of the uh, bicentennial, um, I, it was hot in the jail. Everybody dressed down to nothing but your underwear and your t-shirt because the jail is concrete and steel. And it just doesn't cool down at night. And I looked at all the, the things going on in the jail, the people, the mindset, the drug addicts, the fools, the idiots, the loud mouths, the braggers. Now, what on earth am I doing here? My father didn't raise me this way. Nobody raised me this way. Nobody would believe I was here. And so I realized that I had done my family wrong. I had hurt a lot of people. I would just gone crazy. And I got on my knees. At first, the first two nights, I prayed the way Muslims pray, making Juma, you know, putting my head down to the floor and praying. And nothing happened. I did that two nights in a row. The third night, I prayed the way I saw my grandmother pray on St. James Place in Brooklyn. And instantly, the power of God hit my life. And I began to praise the Lord. Uh, and I've, I've been saved ever since then. I've, I tore up my cigarettes. I washed my hair. I, uh, I, went, I went off, and I've never went back. I've never gone back. That was in 1976. Hmm. Me, myself, I'm a member of the 5% Nation. Maybe you've heard of it. Of course I have. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, that's where I got my understanding. From. Okay. All maybe, right. maybe you should have talked to the gods, though. But, uh, no, I, I okay. you know, I, I, I had talked to five percenters yeah. when I was there. Uh, I did. Um, yeah. But nothing happened. I'm gonna tell yeah, you. that's all right. Now, everybody, you know, I'm not the type of person that feels like my way of life has to be forced upon somebody everybody has free will you know what i mean and what's good for you if that's how if that's how you live your life and it makes you a good person that's good for you i'm not going to condemn you for um your choices per se all right okay all right no, but i could not i don't have to necessarily agree with your choices oh, I, understand that. I, I don't ask you to, you know what i mean i, I don't ask and you if to. i don't agree with you that don't mean i hate you no, i, I just don't mean I, I, no, I you don't agree i understand and we're going to get into some of that a little later especially when we start talking about all this you know homo stuff um 
So you got out, or, or hang on, you got a PhD. Did you get your PhD in prison, or? No. No, when I uh, got out of prison, I completed my education, then went on to get my master's degree at Union Theological Seminary, which has a joint program with, it's right across the street from Columbia University. Okay. I was thinking about becoming an attorney. Yeah, and it's kind of hard to make the bar if you have a criminal background, but it's not impossible. Right. Uh, and I really wanted to become an attorney, but when I was in prison in Rayford, one of the prison guards said to me, you know, they used to call, they call me preacher then. That happens when you start preaching in prison and walking for Jesus, they, that's what they call me. So he said, you know, you ought to go to Union Theological Seminary. Uh, the, the name of the prison I was in was Union Correctional Facility in Rayford, Florida. You went from Union to Union. Yeah. Uh, and Union's a pretty upscale place. It's a pretty prestigious Ivy League school. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I made an application there and they accepted me. So I spent three years at Union uh, working on my Master of Divinity's degree. Um, and uh, they granted me that. I graduated on time and never failed a class. Uh, later on, I was, well, I was a pastor of the church at the time. That had all happened in between that. And I started a school here, and I started a, a, a German who was a, a scholar, a theological scholar from Germany, came who was working at the United Nations. And he heard me preaching on, at the time I was on Salem Radio Broadcasting, WABC Radio. And he, he was working at the United Nations, coming up with a joint program of, at the time was police security and ministry. He joined our church, and he started a seminary here, Atla Theological Seminary. That's the seminary that issued me my PhD. Hmm. Okay. A lot of people rail on me because it's, you know, it's here at this, this church. And, but at any rate, it's just as valid, I think, as anything else or anybody else. I've never been one that's all into, you know, those type of decorations, you know. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I got my GED. Well, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I got. Um, So you, you got out, so, so jail says, I'm gonna be a pastor. You went to seminary school, got your PhD. What happens? You, you, I don't how, do know. You, how do you get a church? Like, how do you get your own church? How did you get this, 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 when this I, beautiful when, building? When I, when I was released from prison, and thank you for the building comment, um, I didn't have a place to go. My sister and my brother-in-law took me in. I was paroled to, to that address. They were members of this church, but in a different building across town on Amsterdam Avenue. Uh, and the following Sunday morning, I followed them to church. I joined this church that very same day I came, and the pastor knew about me. He had written me one letter while I was in prison. And for whatever reason, knowing I just got out of prison, knowing I had done the things I did, he took me in and said, listen, I want to work with you. Uh, I began to drive him around. He had had a couple of heart attacks. He was old, and I began to be his chauffeur. I went to the cleaners for him. I took his wife everywhere she needed to go. I took him everywhere he needed to go. A week or so, a couple of months later, he said, listen, you know, I think maybe I want to put you in ministry, let you be a preacher. So he began to school me and groom me into that process. Actually, six months after I got out of prison, I was an ordained Baptist minister because of my service to him. He really had a lot of faith in me. I mean, to take an ex-con the way he took me in. And, and you know what that sounds like? Sounds like you the Frank Lucas of pastors. He sounds like Bumpy Johnson. <laughs> and, and, and you the Frank <laughs> Lucas. You was his driver. Yeah. And then you ended up yeah. inheriting yeah. the throne, per se. I, I don't know if I want to call it Frank <laughs> Lucas. But, 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 I don't, you know, that was, that was crime. I'm putting it in a way that, that, I know, okay. that, that, that my people can understand. Yeah, yeah, you but that, that's it. That, that's ex well, that's yeah. okay, all right, I agree. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Yeah, my cousins, um, they were avid watchers in porn and had saw me on um, MILF Hunters. Okay. They saw me on MILF, Milf Hunters and they went out and actually bought a movie and took it to my grandmother. You're the only person, one of the few people that looks like you. In my case, one of the only ones that was licensed. Our family was light. Therefore, when we go to our village and when I actually buried my father, I had to bury him. I had to bring up a lot of AK-47s. 